The first thing to say is that the Mediterranean world doesn't exist in isolation. And one of the things that has, has happened is that Greek and Roman mythology has somehow been disconnected, mainly in the 19th century by Europeans, and, you know, to a certain extent whitewashed, right? Taken away from its Mediterranean roots. And, you know, half of the Mediterranean is Africa, right? And we forget that. And the Greeks had a very different attitude to Africa, and that was they saw Ethiopia, Egypt, Kush, Kerma as uh, very ancient and very advanced cultures and civilizations. Civilizations. And we see this reflected here in Black Panther. So for example, in book one of the Iliad, the gods are not on Olympus. They've actually gone to the only humans who they deign worthy of their company to dine with. And that is the- This segment is from a Vanity Fair video featuring Peter Maynick, a distinguished professor of classics at New York University. In this video, he's introduced as a leading authority on mythology, delving into intriguing assertions about world history, particularly the portrayal of European and African history by Hollywood. Although published in 2022, this video resurfaced recently, gaining viral traction. Numerous requests flooded in for my reaction, largely due to the current backlash against the professor. He's facing accusations of dishonesty and being labeled as woke by his detractors. So today we will analyze the video, see if the attacks are justified and try to decode in depth the true and hidden motivations behind all that noise. Without further ado, let's watch the entire video. This scene is from the movie Black Panther. Millions of years ago, a meteorite made of vibranium, the strongest substance in the universe, struck the continent of Africa, affecting the plant life around it. And when the time of men came, five tribes settled on it and called it Wakanda. The first thing to say is that the Mediterranean world doesn't exist in isolation. And one of the things that has, has happened is that Greek and Roman mythology has somehow been disconnected, mainly in the 19th century by Europeans, and, you know, to a certain extent whitewashed, right? Taken away from its Mediterranean roots. And, you know, half of the Mediterranean is Africa, right? And we forget that. And the Greeks had a very different attitude to Africa, and that was they saw Ethiopia, Egypt, Kush, Kerma as uh, very ancient and very advanced cultures and civilizations. And we see this reflected here in Black Panther. So for example, in book one of the Iliad, the gods are not on Olympus. They've actually gone to the only humans who they deign worthy of their company to dine with, and that is the Ethiopians. And then secondly, a lot of what we call Greek mythology are heavily influenced by stories from Africa via Egypt and Kush. I don't think there would be Greek and Roman mythology without these, these ancient African stories. The tribes lived in constant war with each other until a warrior shaman received a vision from the panther goddess Bust, who led him to the heart-shaped herb, a plant that granted him superhuman strength, speed, and instincts. The warrior became king and the first black panther, the protector of Wakanda. So the idea of the panther god and then having a mortal who becomes the panther at certain moments to protect his community relates directly, if you think about it, with Heracles, right? Because Heracles is a lion warrior, I should say. And we call this therianthropy, where a human transforms into an animal to do something superhuman, and you tap into the power of that animal in, in order to protect your community. So we should place Heracles very much in the same world as that. The Wakandans used vibranium to develop technology more advanced than any other nation. But as Wakanda thrived, the world around it descended further into chaos. To keep vibranium safe, the Wakandans vowed to hide in plain sight, keeping the truth of their power from the outside world. One thing I love about this movie is this idea that Wakanda's hidden. You've got this incredibly developed ancient culture and a lot of people responded to that with this movie because that is the truth. Just like Wakanda is hidden, so much of African mythology and ancient history has been hidden to us because what's happened is that through enslavement and colonization, we have a view of the continent of Africa that is completely false, particularly its history and its rich culture. We can't just look at the Greeks and Romans in isolation. They are people of the Mediterranean. They trade, speak to, interrelate with the Africans as 
the Africans do with them. So we have to question why we even call this stuff just Greek and Roman mythology. It's got you know, much wider connotations across the networks of that entire region. In the movie, there's this idea of the astral plane, which is that you can communicate with your ancestors. Your ancestors are going to give you the wisdom that you need to pursue through your life, particularly at times of trouble. <laughs> Baba. And, you know, ancestor worship is a, a, an enormous part of both Greek and Roman culture. The old had very high status in ancient societies because they were the font of knowledge. The Romans actually would take death masks of their ancestors clay versions of them. And then at certain festivals, they would wear the masks of their ancestors and they would parade through the streets in them. Good morning. How can I help you? I'm just checking out these artifacts. They tell me you're the expert. Ah, uh, you could say that. Where is this one from? The Bobo Ashanti tribe, present day Ghana, 19th century. To take that mask and put it in a glass case in a museum is the worst thing you can do to that mask. That mask is supposed to be worn by a performer who's been imbued in a whole culture of dancing and performing and telling those stories over centuries. And now it's become like an aesthetic object with a price on it. And I think this movie actually shows that really well. Now, tell me about this one. Also from Benin, seventh century, <clears throat> Fula tribe, I believe. Nah. I beg your pardon. It was taken by British soldiers in Benin, but it's from Wakanda, and it's made out of vibranium. <laughs> Don't trip. I'm gonna take it off your hands for you. These items aren't for sale. How do you think your ancestors got these? You think they paid a fair price? Or did they take it like they took everything else? Here's a character from that culture who's not really allowed to interface with material from his own culture and is, is actually being scored on it by somebody who's not from that culture. It's about access, right? And I think one of the things this does is it shows us how if you remove an object from the stories that are told about it and the way it's performed, is that object still operating the same way? I love it that he takes a mask at the end and that becomes his character. And even though he uses it in a negative way, for him, it empowers him and that's his connection uh, with his ancestors. You know, I think often we see these objects in museums, but we don't think about them in their, in their real cultural context. Black Panther movie makes people think about that. So today, we'll embark on a deep analysis of the video, assessing whether the criticisms make sense, then we'll expose the hidden motivations behind the backlash. Without delay, let's dive into the full video. The first thing to say is that the Mediterranean world doesn't exist in isolation. And one of the things that has, has happened is that Greek and Roman mythology has somehow been disconnected, mainly in the 19th century by Europeans. And, you know, to a certain extent whitewashed, right? Taken away from its Mediterranean roots. And, you know, half of the Mediterranean is Africa, right? And we forget that. And in this segment, the professor says something very important, even revealing a strategic key about the way history is presented. And in this video, I really want to go deeper down that specific rabbit hole. By the video's end, I'll unveil one of the world's greatest secrets, also explaining why the professor's words carry such weight and controversy. So, grab some popcorn and settle in, because this promises to be an intriguing journey. And we see this reflected here in Black Panther. So for example, in book one of the Iliad, the gods are not on Olympus. They've actually gone to the only humans who they deign worthy of their company to dine with, and that is the Ethiopians. This excerpt is very interesting, but it is also one of those that created the most controversy. The professor simply saying the truth, but some people are bothered by it. I will develop further towards the end of the video. The reality is that ancient Greeks regarded Africans as more advanced than themselves in ancient times. However, this wasn't driven by the racist superiority notions prevalent today. It comes from the acknowledgement that Africans were an older, more knowledgeable group with extensive experience. Contrary to popular belief, they weren't waiting in jungles for Europeans to civilize them. Thus, the Greeks simply recounted the reality of their observations. For instance, Plato said this, compared with the Egyptians, the Greeks are childish mathematicians. And Homer said the following, in Egypt, the men are more skilled in medicine than any of humankind. 
If an African today stated that the U.S. is more technologically advanced than their own country, it wouldn't raise eyebrows. Why? Because it's factual. So, why does the ancient Greeks' truth create so much controversy today? One reason is the West's current position of dominance. However, this shift in power was accompanied by the emergence of racist supremacist ideologies, prompting the concealment of Europe's less flattering past. But there's more to it, and we'll delve into that later in the video, so stay tuned. And then secondly, a lot of what we call Greek mythology are heavily influenced by stories from Africa via Egypt and Kush. I don't think there would be Greek and Roman mythology without these, these ancient African stories. Peter's statements here are undeniably provocative. It's understandable why they've sparked such intense reactions. It's almost jarring to realize that, according to Greek mythology itself, the gods regarded Ethiopians or black Africans as equals. It sounds like a racially charged assertion, yet it's rooted in historical truth. Moreover, Peter's assertion that Greek mythology wouldn't exist without African mythology is quite accurate. But that's a complex issue that we'll explore further towards the conclusion of this video. By the way, do you recall these videos of mine? This one is one of my latest releases, while these are older, more extensive versions that delve deeply into the topic. If you're keen on understanding the African influence on the broader world, particularly ancient European civilizations, I strongly recommend watching them. The tribes lived in constant war with each other until a warrior shaman received a vision from the panther goddess Bust who led him to the heart-shaped herb, a plant that granted him superhuman strength, speed, and instincts. The warrior became king and the first black panther, the protector of Wakanda. So the idea of the panther god and then having a mortal who becomes the panther at certain moments to protect his community relates directly, if you think about it, with Heracles, right? Because Heracles is a lion warrior, I should say. And we call this therianthropy, where a human transforms into an animal to do something superhuman, and you tap into the power of that animal in, in order to protect your community. So we should place Heracles very much in the same world as that. Here lies an issue with his statements and his comparison. I won't accuse him of attempting to appropriate African history, rather, I believe it stems from genuine ignorance. The notion presented in the movie Black Panther isn't a Greek concept, but a distinct product of Africa. We witness it in ancient Egypt and various other African regions, intertwined with totemism. Totemism is the belief in a spiritual connection or kinship between a group of people and a particular animal or natural object, often serving as a symbol of the group's identity or protection. Totemism is recorded across native tribes of Africa, America, and Australia. I've dedicated an entire video to exploring this concept in ancient Egypt and across Africa. You can watch this entire video, but here's a brief excerpt. Have you ever taken a close look at the wastes of pharaohs? Do you notice something? There it is, hanging proudly. Do you know what it is? The bull's tail. It is a bull's tail. A symbol of Pharaoh's strength and procreative ability. But did you know that this tradition has deep roots in Africa long before the birth of Kemet? Let's explore. In early Nilo-Saharan cultures, the boss primogenius Africanus, or wild oxen, held immense importance. They symbolized power and dominance in the Neolithic Western Sahara, the very place where this culture emerged. Around another important site for the emergence of Kemet, Napta Playa. The king, as the chief of the tribe, was chosen to embody the essence of this mighty creature, becoming a metaphor for his own power. Now, let's journey into the realm of African spirituality. According to African spirituality, the universe consists of various spiritual forces that can be combined to enhance one's own power. To tap into this extraordinary energy, ancient Africans incorporated animal body parts into their attire. Take, for instance, the fact that other African kings and priests also wielded a bull's tail through the form of a fly whisk. Or just like the pharaohs, they wore panther skins, especially during important ceremonies like coronations for example. By doing so, 
They added the life force of the bull to their own, amplifying their vitality. To defeat these kings, opponents had to possess a force greater than the combination of the king's life force and that of the bull, and, or the panther, a spiritual battle preceding any physical confrontation. This notion is evident even in Congo with the Leopard Men, or Enyoto, a clandestine society active in West Africa from 1890 to 1935. Members were thought to possess the ability to transform into leopards through witchcraft. Thus, there's no need to look to Greece to find it. This concept has always been part of African culture. In the movie, there's this idea of the astral plane, which is that you can communicate with your ancestors. Your ancestors are going to give you the wisdom you need to pursue through your life, particularly at times of trouble. <laughs> Baba. And, you know, ancestor worship is a, a, an enormous part of both Greek and Roman culture. The old had very high status in ancient societies because they were the font of knowledge. The Romans actually would take death masks of their ancestors clay versions of them, and then at certain festivals they would wear the masks of their ancestors and they would parade through the streets in them. Here I'll only emphasize one crucial point, which is that the practice originates from Africa. It's widely known that ancestors' worship is fundamental in many African cultures, evident not only in ancient Egypt, but also throughout the continent. Traditional African spirituality is rooted in the belief that ancestors maintain a spiritual connection with their living relatives. Thus, there's no need to look beyond Africa to understand this concept. Good morning. How can I help you? I'm just checking out these artifacts. They tell me you're the expert. Ah, uh, you could say that. Where is this one from? The Bobo Ashanti tribe, present day Ghana, 19th century. To take that mask and put it in a glass case in a museum is the worst thing you can do to that mask. That mask is supposed to be worn by a performer who's been imbued in a whole culture of dancing and performing and telling those stories over centuries. And now it's become like an aesthetic object with a price on it. And I think this movie actually shows that really well. In this segment, he is spot on. In the African context, from ancient Egypt to other parts of the continent, the statues and other artifacts have never been considered pieces of art. This is a European concept. Professor Kaba even talks about it in the following video. Do they hit the arts? The arts are key, you know. A society that has time to deal with the arts is a civilized society. A society that must take its art money and put it into the military complex or into these, their own self-centered plans you can see what's happening to the society. If you lose your art, art is not entertainment. Dance and song is not entertainment. It never was amongst Africans. It was as viable a way of communicating as Imhotep was writing a medical book. These pieces were considered alive. They were receptacles for the ancestors and spirits when they came back to Earth. For example, that's one of the reasons behind the noses being broken off. Because with that belief, Breaking the nose was a way to prevent the ancestor from coming back to life. Now, tell me about this one. Also from Benin, 7th century, <clears throat> Fula tribe, I believe. Nah. I beg your pardon. It was taken by British soldiers in Benin, but it's from Wakanda, and it's made out of vibranium. <laughs> Don't trip, I'm gonna take it off your hands for you. These items aren't for sale. How do you think your ancestors got these? You think they paid a fair price? Or did they take it like they took everything else? Here's a character from that culture who's not really allowed to interface with material from his own culture and is, is actually being schooled on it by somebody who's not from that culture. It's about access, right? And I think one of the things this does is it shows us how if you remove an object from the stories that are told about it and the way it's performed, is that object still operating the same way? I love it that he takes a mask at the end and that becomes his character. And even though he uses it in a negative way, for him it empowers him and that's his connection uh, with his ancestors. You know, I think often we see these objects in museums, but we don't think about them in their, in their real cultural context. Black Panther movie makes people think about that. Here, nothing to add. It is very well said. Now, let's talk about the most controversial part of the video. 
While some may overlook its importance, believe me, it's strategic. Let's watch it. This scene is from the movie Black Panther. Millions of years ago, a meteorite made of vibranium, the strongest substance in the universe, struck the continent of Africa, affecting the plant life around it. And when the time of men came, five tribes settled on it and called it Wakanda. The first thing to say is that the Mediterranean world doesn't exist in isolation. And one of the things that has, has happened is that Greek and Roman mythology has somehow been disconnected, mainly in the 19th century by Europeans, and, you know, to a certain extent whitewashed, right, taken away from its Mediterranean roots. And, you know, half of the Mediterranean is Africa, right? And we forget that. Once again, in this excerpt, he's absolutely right. I don't see what more I can add. This issue runs deeper than just the representation of African art in museums. Our understanding of history and ancient civilizations, in general, is skewed because of this same problem. Many people fail to consider the context and inadvertently impose their modern ideals and perceptions onto the past and its inhabitants. I'm not immune to this mistake, despite my awareness of the issue, and I try my best to avoid falling into that trap. Furthermore, this problem extends beyond the realm of so-called African art in museums. Our perception of history and ancient civilizations, in general, is tainted by this bias. Now, we'll address the crux of the matter in this excerpt, the one that stirred up so much controversy. I'll reveal why it's the most clandestine and critical strategy for deceiving the masses, and I'll explain how it's executed. This is a revelation I've never shared before, so I urge you to stay focused until the end of the video. When we delve deeply into our world, it's apparent that there's a strong inclination to compartmentalize world history, populations, and even genetics. This contradiction is strange, considering that mainstream discourse often advocates the concept of one human race and our interconnectedness. However, at the same time, it indirectly promotes the opposite. But why does this dysfunction persist in the process? When people lie, things get messy. It's like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. You might be wondering what I mean by that. You know when a story is true, everything flows because it simply makes sense. The problem with lies is that they aren't naturally connected to the rest of reality. So, blending them into the narrative requires considerable effort because they don't belong there. It's like trying to force a square into a circular hole, like those puzzles we played when we were younger. It takes a lot of mental gymnastics to make it fit. So, in this case, the professor highlighted the extensive compartmentalization of world history, ancient populations, and even genetics. Now, you might be wondering why there's such a strong need to compartmentalize history. Well, because it enables the perpetrators to do something that would not be possible otherwise. And it is, to completely rewrite it. Let me break it down. Sometimes, when people dislike a certain reality, they resort to completely avoiding or concealing it. In our case, if everyone perceives the world as it truly is, interconnected, with a flow originating from Africa and spreading globally, it becomes impossible for people to distort it. It just naturally aligns. And the most skilled liars often use half-truths. Why? Because it makes it more believable. The minor truths they share bring relevancy to their major lies. And since most people don't go deep to check what they are being told, they'll think, if this first argument is true, then the rest must also be true, right? Through this method, deceivers gradually sow confusion among the masses, ultimately reshaping reality to their advantage. That's precisely what unfolds in world history, particularly in African and Mediterranean narratives. For racism to maintain its hold, reality must undergo a redefinition, as it's not grounded in facts, but rather in a deeply flawed and childish fantasy. For example, we're not supposed to acknowledge that the Greeks learned from the black people of Africa, despite their own admission. That's why modern racist historians intentionally conceal or downplay Africa's influence on these European civilizations. And when the truth becomes too evident, they resort to an even more insidious strategy, pushing the same agenda even further. Remember how I mentioned earlier that they compartmentalize everything? 
Well, when the truth becomes too glaring, they double down on the same agenda and compartmentalize history even further, often resorting to the most far-fetched and unscientific assertions. But what exactly does compartmentalizing mean? It means dividing into distinct sections or categories. In our case, they'll divide the world, and especially Africa, into isolated categories, completely disregarding the strong interconnectedness of the continent's entire population. But then again, what more can we expect from racists, right? So, the entire concept hinges on this tactic. But why? Once again, I'll reveal the hidden agenda in full at the end of this video, so stay tuned. Take Africa, for instance. When the agenda is pushed even further, ancient Egyptians are stripped of their ties to Africa. They're depicted as a separate population that mysteriously appeared in North Africa, disconnected from the land they emerged from. Simultaneously, another narrative they favor promoting is one of a migration of a completely separate population originating from the Middle East. That's the only other acceptable alternative. Either the population appeared in Egypt, completely disconnected from the South, or they originated from the Middle East, being Eurasians. Do you see the problem here? It's evident that there's a hidden agenda behind all these theories, a target that must be unequivocally separated from Kemet. Do you see who it is? Indeed, black people. So don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that that mythology isn't its own interesting field of studies, but a statement from someone who is an expert in Roman and Greek mythology saying that it wouldn't exist without Africa, it's nonsense, absolutely nonsense. For instance, Bernal in the book Black Athena, which is a text that needs to be taken with a grain of salt, but it is rich in an interesting suggestions, rightly emphasizes the points of contact and cultural connections the Greeks' myths have towards Egypt and the Near East. But looking for connection with Black Panther and Central Africa is absurd. In this segment, the YouTuber's disdain is palpable as he mentions Central Africa, reinforcing what I've just discussed and what we've previously addressed. We always come back to the same outcome. Linking the greatness of Kemet to the most dominant indigenous group and phenotype of Africa is problematic. In the previous video, that group is referred to as Central Africans. Yet again, despite the Great Sphinx still standing there, built by the natives, representing one of their most influential rulers, and bearing a striking resemblance to Central Africans. People have opted to disregard reality. Instead, they prioritize opinions over facts. That's supposedly how scientific work is done. Just like YouTubers who propagate nonsense. We're expected to ignore facts and accept their fabricated version of African history. The Kemites themselves have consistently asserted that their origins trace back to the south. Take Sudan, for instance, particularly ancient Sudan, the land of the Nubians. Remember, Sudan forms the southern border of Kemet and has always been directly linked to Central Africa. Why? Because these are the same populations inhabiting the banks of the Nile. They migrated from further south and settled there, it's just common sense. Now, let's delve a bit deeper. Here's how the ancient Egyptians depicted those they labeled as Nubians. What do you observe? They bear a striking resemblance to populations found in Central Africa, West Africa, and regions around South Sudan, Congo, Burundi, and so forth. Today, we understand that human beings originated from Africa. Some of our ancestors migrated from Africa to populate the rest of the world. The Sphinx serves as a perfect example of what these ancient African populations, many of whom settled in North Africa, looked like back then. The Secret In October 2011, Walter Isaacson's book Steve Jobs hit the shelves. It mesmerized readers with its captivating portrayal of the Apple CEO. I remember picking up a copy and diving into it. It was truly engrossing. In the book, Jobs talks about his first day at Reed College in Oregon. The first day on campus is a pivotal moment for all young students. They are usually accompanied by both their parents. But in the case of the young Steve Jobs, the journey took an unexpected turn. Before they even reached their destination, Jobs asked his parents to halt the car a few blocks away. Normally, 
parents accompany their children to their dorm rooms, sharing in the excitement of this new chapter. Despite his parents' love, support, and financial investment in his education, Jobs made a surprising request. He wanted them to turn back. He insisted on continuing the journey alone, on foot. In hindsight, Jobs admitted regret over this decision. He reflected on his youth, acknowledging his own immaturity and stubbornness in that moment. Now, you might be wondering why I'm bringing up Steve Jobs. Well, in that tale lies a crucial insight that can help us understand why we face this issue with African history. And I'll reveal it to you shortly. Unfortunately, we have to end the video here due to YouTube's censorship policies. The second part of our discussion has been deemed too sensitive for advertisers. However, at Mr. Imhotep, we stand for truth. That's why we're sharing the full, uncensored video exclusively on Patreon. Interested in understanding the deep connections between Steve Jobs, African history, and where it all leads? Join us on Patreon where we delve into the uncensored truth. Support our mission by becoming a patron today. The link is in the description below and in the comments. Thank you for watching and supporting our channel. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for notifications. If you can't join Patreon right now, no worries, I understand. My goal has always been to educate freely, but it demands significant investment of time, money, and effort. After years of giving back, I need your support to continue serving our community. Let's discuss the video's content in the comments. Do you agree with my conclusions? Should the professor face backlash, or is the issue with those criticizing him? I address this in the second part, hidden due to censorship. If you want access, you know what to do. If you enjoyed this video, you will definitely find the following videos equally enriching. Thank you once again for watching. See you in the next one.